What's up guys, Mike BAK Phony, this is the BFF Report, and today it's the top five most controversial games of 2012. Easily, easily the biggest undertaking to complete. And as you guys can see by the timestamp, we have a lot to talk about today, so let's go ahead and get started. Terra had a pretty turbulent run this year, way more than the average Asian import. And like everything else on this year's list, it's really hard to find a place to start. So let's begin with a couple things that players really hate. One, players don't like being region locked, especially when hardcore US and EU Terra fans have been playing K Terra beta for so long. Well, in 2010, NMAS's community manager Evan Scapes Berman said that neither publisher really plans on blocking IPs. They even said it on Twitter. They even said it on Twitter. They even said it on Twitter again and again, right? So apparently things changed because in 2012, Terra's publisher in EU, Frogster, blocked former CIS regions and the freaking motherland itself, Russia, citing legal concerns, which is a fairly transparent response compared to their, you know, sister publisher in North America, MS, who decided that Asia, Africa, Russia, and the Middle East, and pretty much everywhere else these dirty cyber criminals hail from, needed to be blocked in the name of upholding a standard of service for their players. So F the other 50% of the world that wants to play the game, I suppose. Which brings us to the next thing we don't like, censorship, which could have been part of the reason why everyone is throwing up IP blocks everywhere. It's possible, and this is like 99% centered around Frogster, by the way, because for some strange reason, a game with blood, violence, large jiggly boobs, and scantily clad little girls earned a rating of Peggy 12, even though everywhere else it's rated mature. It's weird, right? Well, first, Frogster threw this girl some clothes, reduced the swearing, got rid of some guild icons because, shocker, allowing players to upload custom graphics results in dicks and pink swastikas everywhere. I guess these guys ever played APB. And then later players noticed that following some beta patches, bloodshed throughout the game was also disappearing. All unannounced changes, by the way. So as you'd expect, this spawned angry threads and petitions everywhere, because petitions pretty much fix everything on the internet, to revert these changes back, and Frogster community manager Raven stepped in pointing out that, uh, unfortunately they were forced to remove the blood slider, remove blood from the ground, and modify blood effect on the screen to coincide with their new rating to cater to 12 year olds. Lovely, isn't it? The next thing players hate is corny, and the MMO faux promotion was full of it. MMO fighter Boss Rutten plays the role of terrible Terry Tate. The traditional gamers play the role of lazy employees. Reebok is played by the newcomer Terra, and the role of funny is pretty much written out of the script. Or we could say that Boss is Macho Man Randy Savage. Terra is a Slim Jim, and non-MMO foes are the guys eating the boring beef jerky. Look, it's been done before and it's corny. The goal is to show an idolized model athlete squashing mediocrity and the 12 year olds eat it up. But hey, the game is rated Peggy 12 and mature ratings don't mean dick here in the States, so I guess in a sense they nailed it. Let's not forget that the entire time they are fumbling around with these points, they are also somewhat involved in a lawsuit over some former Antisoft employees stealing, quote, copious amounts of confidential and proprietary Antisoft information, computer software, hardware, and artwork relating to Lineage 3. And these guys later started up a little company called Bluehole Studio and, as you guys know, made a little game called Terra. Now, these guys were, in fact, convicted in Korea for stealing trade secrets, but the game developed by their studio was not found guilty of using these stolen assets. NCSoft is clearly not happy about this, so they proceed with bringing the fight stateside in an attempt to disrupt the launch of the game and hopefully make them look bad, and obviously feel bad. But despite all this, the game did eventually launch on time. A few months later, it was announced that Bluehold and NCSoft came to an amicable free monetary agreement out of court and the case was dropped. Fast forward to Christmas and it's announced that K-Terra will be going free to play with a major content patch coming in January. But NMAS community manager Manea says it's isolated to K-Terra and they currently have no plans on changing their model anywhere else. So what about all the other stuff that comes with this patch? Well, like every other piece of content released for Terra, EU and NA players will have to sit around and wait for their sloppy seconds. If you've watched the top five most controversial games of 2011 video, you guys know that number one was World of Warcraft and Diablo. It's a little bit of Diablo, mainly because they just announced the Real Money Auction House and that was kind of a big deal. Well, here they are again on the top five and this time they are bringing a lot of drama with them, which is to be expected because there was a good decade gap between Diablo 2 and Diablo 3. A lot of things have changed. A lot of gamers have changed themselves and obviously there's friction between players and the developers since these are not the same guys who made Diablo 2. It's basically the whole you're not my real dad mentality. You see, they announced the game back in June of 2008, and then after a couple of setbacks, they decided to go ahead and finally let us into the closed beta, which occurred at the end of 2011. Besides the Real Money Auction House, the only thing that really ever got tested was the, the first act, like part of the first act, and of course the various classes you're able to play through that. But let's be fair, because Diablo 2's beta was pretty much about the same thing. Obviously it went out to like, you know, maybe 100,000 less people, but... It did include uh, the first act, a couple characters to play on, and of course PvP, which we'll get to in just a minute. So as we creep through the first several months of 2012, we finally get a release date of May 15th. 
for Diablo 3. And of course, the crowd goes wild. Everyone goes out and they buy a whole bunch of chips of soda and everything. Everyone's planning on camping out. And finally, finally the game launches. And what happens next will be remembered forever. Or at least anytime somebody brings up Diablo 3. <laughs> Error 37 was the error heard around the world. It, it was so huge that it instantly became a meme because you think about it, you have one of the fastest selling games of all time, primarily a single player campaign, arguably a single player campaign oriented game that you can't connect to a server to actually play. That's right, there's no offline play in Diablo 3, which you would think would be a big deal to a lot of gamers, and it was, but clearly not enough because they all still bought into it. So I guess it's really not all that controversial. Until, of course, Air 37. There was even its own website, Air37.com, that is still up to this day. It was trending worldwide on Twitter, Air 37. You could even buy merchandise with Air 37 on it. Air 37 the t-shirt, Air 37 the hat, Air 37 the flamethrower. That kids love this one. But the best and probably the most overshadowed part of this entire event was that they knew about Air 37 a week ahead of time. It was even in their launch night guide. It says, please be aware that a delay of up to 40 seconds is possible while the game attempts to connect you. If your connection doesn't succeed in 40 seconds, you'll be presented with an Air 37 message and asked to try again. If you see this error, it does in fact mean that you should try again. They were obviously pretty confident going into this, right? I mean, they basically said, you know, as put here by PC Gamers, like, Air 37 is no cause for concern. Don't worry, guys. I got this. Just didn't quite roll out that way. Now, once the dust settled and everything was taken care of, Blizzard came out and they apologized for all of the errors that people were encountering logging into the game because Beyond Era 37 was 3005, 3006, and all these other ones are attached to it. They went on to say they're going to continue monitoring performance to take measures needed to ensure a positive experience for everyone. Fortunately, two weeks later, it did pretty much happen again. I wish I could say that was the end for Diablo 3, but it wasn't by a long shot. Let's start with the Real Money Auction House. You see, it didn't come out right when the game launched here in the States or in EU. It actually didn't come out for quite some time. And if you live in South Korea, it never came out. The reason why is because back in June, they banned the sale on all virtual items. But don't worry, even if it did get up and running over there, you'd probably end up getting banned anyways in the first couple minutes of making your first purchase. So people are playing the game, having a good time. One person actually beat it, one person didn't believe them. That rustles and jimmies. But it's only logical that if you have one of the fastest selling PC games of all time, you're probably gonna have one of the highest return counts of all time as well. And bear in mind that the game didn't exactly stabilize after the first Error 37 fiasco. It, it was definitely a little rough for a couple weeks after that. So much so that the Korean FTC put out a notice about a week later saying that uh, they, they realized there was a lot of complaints coming in and about 150 a day. So we're gonna go ahead and take a look at it. And then about a week and a half later, they went ahead and raided the offices of Blizzard there in Seoul, Korea. And as you'd expect, a couple weeks after that, Blizzard went ahead and authorized the refund of any account with characters under level 40 between June 25th and July 3rd and then beyond that, any character under level 20 within 14 days of purchase. And then things started getting really weird past this, okay? So we know that there's gonna be bugs in a game that's not fully tested. Diablo 3 was obviously a game that was not thoroughly tested beginning to end because we found tons of bugs and there's lots of patches that came out afterwards to fix these bugs. And of course, there was the, the God Mode uh, invincible exploit that was being done, which wouldn't be so bad if sites like Ko will suck balls for hits. Taku didn't post in detail how to execute the exploit. But a lot of this is standard fare for unpolished games, which honestly Diablo 3 was. But we have to draw the line somewhere. How about we go and start with making new players wait 72 hours to unlock the full game after purchasing it? Whose idea was this? And then there was the interview that Ink Gamers did with David Brevik, who's the original creator of the Diablo series, who a lot of Diablo fans look up to, where in not so few words, he says that he would not do things the way that they did, and he doesn't understand why they did them that way. Now, while this isn't something that you would typically see from somebody in a very public forum to come out and basically blast a, a very, very successful game, we have to understand that this is his baby. This is his game. But Diablo 3 has a new daddy, and that daddy is Jay Wilson. And what did he have to say about this? Well, in not so few words, fuck that loser. Actually, I'm kidding. Those are his exact words. Now, I don't think I need to tell you the fallout that came from this. It was huge. Imagine everybody that loved David Brevik, which there are a lot of people that do. And everybody loves to hate on Diablo 3. Whether or not they have a good reason to, it doesn't matter. They love to hate on Diablo 3. So Jay Wilson being the current game director, the creator of Diablo 3, essentially, for him to dismiss David as fuck that loser is kind of like dismissing everybody who believes in what David believes in, which is kind of a lot of people. And as you'd expect, within a couple days of being caught, he put out a very, very lengthy apology, not only Brevik, but also to the fans. And with this being a very, very public apology, a lot of people picked it up and, you know, a lot, a lot of people said, especially media, they said that he's only apologizing because he got caught. Now, I hate to be that guy, but why would he apologize otherwise? 
fast forward to December because honestly, they've earned their position in this countdown already. Let's go ahead and move on. December 27th. There is a blog post from the Diablo 3 team where they basically talk about uh, PvP and how it's going to get scrapped. The reason why is because we don't feel the current mode is good enough. So that PvP element that you played a couple years ago at BlizzCon is simply not up to their standards. It seems to me that the Diablo team is losing sight of the difference between an attainable goal and an unrealistic goal. And in the end, it means less content for players, which in turn means less time spent in your game, which results in less content. And it will continue to go back and forth until pretty much the next Diablo expansion, in which case we'll start all over again. Star Wars Old Republic may have cashed in with their late appearance in 2011 with, you know, random awards and all that, but that shit doesn't work on me. Everyone knows that big stuff in MMOs happen after launch. But as we all know, the game launched less than a week before Christmas. I mean, if you were playing on the EU servers and weren't part of the Head Start, you were getting the game on, on the Christmas Eve Eve. And according to Ray and Greg, this was a massively successful launch. They came out three days after the US official launch, and they said that they had a million registered users and growing. And let me tell you, the first two weeks of launch were like, the, those, those were like the golden weeks. Like, that's when everything was fantastic, everybody loved the game-ish, and everything was great. But then we started getting some weird news, right? First, UK sales take a dive based off of Chart Track, okay? The site that tracks sales says that they dropped from number 10 to number 38. Doesn't seem like that big of a deal is around Christmas time, lots of games are on sale. Maybe your game that's brand new that's not on sale isn't going to be the number one seller. Makes sense, okay? Then we had one of these analyst articles that the internet loves because these guys get paid to guess, right guys? Well, this guy said he had creepy concerns about Switch West performance, which allegedly resulted in a 3% drop in share price. Where does this guy get his info, though? It's not like strange and questionable things are occurring that would make me think they're losing subscribers, right? I mean, a couple days before the end of the first 30 days, they had a, f a free content patch. That's, that's great, right? It came with something really interesting called the Founder's Title, but you only got it if you paid for another month. Even though you owned the game previously, you only qualify for it if you pay for an extra month. But if I was an analyst, I wouldn't really look at any of this as being, you know, like a red flag or anything. I mean, I would say that, you know, the Founders title thing's a bit unorthodox, but it keeps money coming in, that's all that matters. And besides, if players want to quit, all they have to do is go and click the unsubscribe button. Oh. Okay, okay, well, let's let's check the community forums to see what the, what the player feedback is. Let's check the forums, let's check the news sites, see what are people saying about the game? It's gotta be a great game, right? I mean, first month, people are getting a free content and everything oh wow wow really wow, texture is that bad a feature huh that's kind of funny well ability delay wow that's that's not good yikes oh wow a major feature that just sucks okay wow oh, holy crap okay, okay all of this is happening in the first month that's not good i should sell all of my stock right now and tell all my friends including the internet to sell everything they have because this doesn't look good and suddenly this analyst seems to kind of know what the hell he's talking about well, no, because on February 1st, EA came out and they said that they've sold 2 million units and had 1.7 million active subscribers-ish. I mean, the guys who gave their credit card information over, they're gonna pay for a month, right? So on the money side, things are pretty quiet for about a month and a half, two months. And during this time, Bioware had their hands full with obviously all of these graphic issues and patch 1.2 and ability delays and their open world PvP zone still sucking. I mean, these guys obviously had their hands full. And when you have 1.7 million subscribers, which in this industry is huge, if you're not World of Warcraft, then you need to stay on it, right? I mean, the last thing you'd want to do right now is lay out 500 to 1,000 people, because that would be a pretty big red flag to players and the industry that something might be going wrong with your product. But that's just a rumor, right? And Daniel Erickson said that the sub numbers haven't dropped, and shut up, analysts! Okay, look, so what if we laid off 500,000 people? So what if we lost 400,000 subscribers? Those are just the casuals anyways. No one cares about the casuals. There's no need to panic. Let's all just sit back, relax, enjoy the game. We're gonna go ahead and let go of a few more people. Some may be community facing, but that's okay. Things like layoffs and server merges are pretty common following an MMO launch. You get tons of people coming in and playing the game and some of them just don't stick around. That's pretty common. However, what's not so common is talking about going free to play within six to seven months of launching your game. Well, actually, if I'm being fair, he said that they would embrace the free to play model if necessary. And we're gonna get right on that just as soon as we get rid of this EP and sprinkle some layoffs on it. And then by the end of July, they made the announcement official that it will be going free to play by fall. But they also made a point to bring up that they did have well over 500,000 people playing the game, which is weird, right? You would think that a, a, a game that has over 500,000, well over 500,000 subscribers wouldn't have an issue with making money. I mean, there's lots of other MMOs that don't have this pro- Oh, you're right. You know what? I'm, I don't even know what I was thinking. I don't even know. 
And then over the next several months, we had a couple things happen. Nothing too major. Sure, the guys who found Bioware, they retired, but it's not related to Star Wars Old Republic or the terrible ending of Mass Effect 3. And of course, Daniel Erickson's actively looking for new opportunities. He might just be getting bored. But let's talk about the real important stuff, like the game actually converting to free to play. Because the way that it did it was fucking weird. First, it's divided up into three different categories. You have subscription, preferred status, and free to play. We're gonna go ahead and start with the subscription because it's the easiest. If you were paying, you're not really gonna see that much of a difference. You're gonna get bonus cartel coins more for the longer that you're subscribed, so that's kind of a nice bonus. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you have the free to play. And these guys, there's some limitations here I totally understand. Like for example, two character slots, three races when you're making your character, smaller bag space, no bank. You can't send mail. You can to how much currency your character can hold. All this stuff makes sense for a free to play game. Then some things get kind of questionable. Five war zones per week, three flashpoints, three space missions. I mean, why would they limit the content? The whole point of going free to play is so you get more people playing the game. The more they play the game, the more money they're gonna spend on stuff. Now in a typical free to play scenario, you'd make it so that people could buy things like boosts so you could get more XP. Well, the way they're doing it, they're doing it ass backwards. You don't get any rest XP as a free to play player. You even earn less experience. Then when you go to buy stuff from the vendor, you have to pay more like EA has got to cut a freeloader tax on this. And then these two items just really make me scratch my head. First off, you have to pay to hide your helm? Am I the only one that thinks that sounds petty? And then the other one, quick bars. The little quick slots where you put your skills and abilities, they only allow you to have two of them. Now some of these things can be slightly modified if you were to pay at least $4.99 to become a preferred status member. It's a one-time thing. Just buy one thing, $4.99, and boom, preferred status. But it won't lift limitations on content though. You have to pay for passes to get full access to that stuff. So I don't get it. It's like they want to make the free to play players lives miserable until they spend $5. But that doesn't make me want to spend $5. It makes me want to not play this game. Five war zones, three flashpoints, three space missions. What if I want to play Hutball at least three or four times and in the rotation I get it once? And then when I go and do flashpoints, what if I don't get anything that I want those first three runs? Wouldn't it make sense to allow me to continue playing the game to run them to provide a service for other players who are looking for others to run these flashpoints? I mean, it's not like these things are just overflowing with players trying to get in there. It seems pretty obvious that EA and Bioware do not understand the value of having a living, breathing person there to provide a service. They're playing the game. Therefore, they're, they're adding to the atmosphere for other players who are playing the game. They're adding to the MMO aspect of your MMO. But whatever, you know, it just went free to play. We're, we might see some changes come down the line over the next several months. But here's a good test. Ilum is coming back sometime this year. Ilum is the open world PvP zone that failed miserably at launch. They took it down, made it disappear. Now it's coming back. If it's still an open world PvP zone and they put limits on the free to play player base in the way of, you know, preventing access to this particular zone or limiting the number of times they can access this zone, then I think it's pretty fair to say that EA and Bioware just have no idea what they're doing. In order to really get a full grasp on the impact that 38 Studios had, the reason why it's on this top five list, we have to go back to 2006 when Kurt Schilling, Major League Baseball player, a popular one at that, starts 38 Studios and announces its first game to be an MMO codenamed Project Copernicus. And he's even secured names like best-selling author Ari Salvatore and Todd McFarlane, the creator of the comic book Antihero Spawn, to assist in building the game's universe. So far, it's sounding pretty good, right? Then in 2009, they came out and they said they needed some more money, something on the tune of like 50 to 100 million dollars to complete the project. Well, keep in mind, they just picked up another 70 employees when they acquired big, huge games, who just happened to be working on a single player RPG. Yes, we're talking about the early stages of Kingdoms of Amalur. But remember, these guys are looking for money. They didn't just come up with this game out of thin air. And since we all know the game launched, guess where they got that money from? The state of Rhode Island. That's right, the R-I-E-D-C, Rhode Island Economic Development Corporation. And what these guys specialize in is bringing jobs to the state or creating jobs within the state. They're just job makers, that's what they do. It's a job where you make jobs. And part of this massive $75 million deal was that Kurt Schilling would make some jobs. And that's it. Bring the company to the state, make some jobs, and we'll give you $75 million. Now in a perfect world, this makes a whole lot of sense. You, you, you have an idea for making a fantastic MMO that you know is gonna be successful, but you need money. Well, how are you gonna get money? Well, let's make a smaller game based in the same universe, which is what Reckoning is. We'll throw that out there. People are gonna love it. We're gonna make some money off of it and they'll be introduced to the universe and they're gonna want more. Now we have money, now we have exposure and everything's gonna be great. The target was 450 direct jobs. Those are jobs in the States by the end of 2012. And with the smash hit like Reckoning coming out, that should be pretty easy to hit. Unfortunately, it wasn't as much of a smash hit as they had hoped. 410,000 units sold within the first couple months, which is good for a new IP. It's fantastic. 
But I think these guys were gunning for the millions, especially when you have the R.A. Salvatore, Todd McFarlane, and Ken Ralston on board. All These are some huge names. But unfortunately, the game still ended up being regarded to as just kind of a generic action RPG. A good one, but overall still kind of generic. So now we're in May 2012, and unfortunately, 38 Studios missed a payment. This is a loan repayment. It's like one point something million dollars to pay back for all the money that they got from the state. So what does Kurt Schilling do? He asked for more money. And unfortunately, the result of that meeting did not go well at all. As a matter of fact, it was painful to watch what happened after. It was a closed door meeting, no press allowed. Afterwards, they gave statements, essentially saying that they were going to consider whether or not to give them more money. But listen to what Governor Chaffee says. How do we avoid throwing good money after bad? That's pretty huge. He basically just said the whole thing's a failure. But the next day, 38 Studios hand delivers a check for $1.125 million. This is their missed payment money, right? This is the rent, and they bounced the shit out of that. Oh, but that's not all. On the same day, we learned that they're not even paying their employees, so nobody is getting money. That same day, the head of the RIEDC, the guy who basically forged the entire deal with them, resigns. So much is happening in so few days, right? The next day, guess what? Payment made. Also, Project Copernicus is going to be pushed back to about June 2013. Also, also, we haven't paid our employees just yet. The following week, they unfortunately had to let go of a few people, somewhere in the range of 100% of the staff. Now remember, there's more than one part to this loan deal they got. They had to make payments on time, which they failed to do, and they had to keep people employed, which, as I just told you, they failed to do. So from a rumor that they were having financial issues to shutting down took 10 days. So everybody's gone, financial audits begin, bankruptcies filed, and the estimated total that they owe is $150.7 million. And guess who has to pay for it? The Rhode Island taxpayers. Now to help ease the cost a little bit, they decided to go in there and auction off everything from 38 Studios Big Huge Games. You know how much money they made? $650,000. Which is great news because now the taxpayers only owe $150,050,000. Now, as if this whole thing wasn't a bad idea to begin with, you know, mixing politics and business, the governor decides he's going to sue Kurt Schilling. And suing costs money, a lot of money, especially when it's over $150 million. So how much of that is the state really going to get back? Assuming, of course, that they win. And besides that, this goes against the reason why they brought him there to begin with. They gave them money so they create jobs. It didn't work out. You don't sue them afterwards. That's not how the system works. Now this governor is telling the people of Rhode Island that he's going to do anything it takes to protect you. You work hard for your money and the squandering of tax dollars and all this stuff. But he pretty much just spent it on years of litigation. It's clearly because nobody wants to take the blame for this. Now, throughout this entire process, they release all these, these videos and screenshots and all of this stuff for Copernicus. Nobody gives a shit. It's dead. It, oh, it's going to be free to play? Who cares? The main thing we should understand from this is how much it affects the entire gaming industry. Now, whenever somebody's looking to give a massive loan to somebody who says they have a great idea for a video game, they're always going to look at 38 Studios. That's going to be the example. Any state that has state funding for this kind of stuff anywhere is going to get flack because they're just, they're just going to use that as... Uh, as the reason why you shouldn't do it. And yes, I agree, they should not have given 38 Studios 70 million dollars. Because what they end up doing, they relocated a whole bunch of people, they hired people temporarily essentially, and now they left 400 families in disarray, millions of dollars has to get paid back by taxpayers, some of them those same ones you just laid off, and a scar on the hand of every developer that seeks state assistance. Not to mention the question of, should we spend 75 million dollars in taxpayer money on video games? Now, I'm sorry if I sound a little frustrated, it's because I am. All of this stemmed from the deal between 38 Studios' Kurt Schilling, the head of the EDC, Keith Stokes, and former Governor Cartieri. And while the whole thing did fail, the last thing that should happen is Governor Chaffee stepping in to white knight the taxpayers by spending taxpayer money to sue Kurt Schilling. So you see, everybody involved in this is an idiot. So yes, I'm a little frustrated. Sometime around mid-July, we got a couple of interviews popping up from IGN and PC Gamer. This is probably the first time that a lot of you guys heard of the game War Z. And given its sudden appearance and the fact that the game was slated to come out this fall, the interviewers weren't really afraid to ask questions like, is this a DayZ ripoff? Because let's be honest, when you're making an open world zombie survival game at the same time that a game like DayZ is becoming massively popular, you have to expect these kinds of questions. And Sergei was not afraid to answer them. In the PC Gamer article, they said they've been thinking about and drafting the design for a large open world zombie survival 
survival game for the last couple years. Then on the IGN side, Sergei says, when Daisy was released to the public, we were really excited to see another game that was akin to what we were working on. We were like, wow, that's cool. We're not the only ones making something like this. Now, to be fair, it's difficult to pinpoint exactly when Daisy was, quote, released to the public, but what we can say is that it, it was pretty much out in April, but largely unknown until May or June. Now things start to get kind of weird around here, so we're gonna begin our journey from these articles and go backwards. The IGN article was released on July 19, 2012. On that very same day, they created a Twitter account, a YouTube page, and a Facebook page. You have to ignore what it says down here, go on the first post because you can put anything you want down here. Look, this is mine, see? Now we could probably say that this is due to the fact that they probably don't have a social media manager, so they didn't know they needed these things until this article was getting released, and they freaked out and they created it all at once. Okay, sure, no problem. But why the hell would they wait until now to file the trademark? Did they forget about that too? What about the domain name, thewarz.com? We take a look at this, and we see that they registered it on 24 May 2012. So far, all we're seeing is things that point to months, but definitely not years. So let's go back about another week. Here's Roman Stepanov, who's the art director for Arctos Entertainment Group. He's one of the guys I was working on War Inc. before they dumped it for War Z. He likes to play Day Z, and here he is participating on a thread talking about how, you know, his company, Online Warmongers, has the engine, the artists, the programmers, the designers, and the tech to make something similar to Day Z on the PC. At the exact same time, on War Inc.'s forums, Sergey talks about a video that they were sent a couple weeks ago showing this extra cool idea, he says. A huge open world infested with zombies. He then goes on to talk about how the closest thing it resembles is Day Z. Now, how do we know exactly when this is posted? Well, that's actually really easy. Here's the link to it. But shocker, it's deleted. But it's not hard to find the links in front and behind it with the time date stamps. Now right about here is where the backtracking ends. Let's go ahead and take everything and reconstruct it in forward chronological order and I'll allow you guys to be the judges of whether or not you think that they just kind of came up with the idea at the last second to, you know, cash in on the whole popularity of DayZ. Sergey and Roman, both employees of the same company at that time, both come up with the War Z concept two different ways. One saying it was a video sent to them, the other one saying that it's something we think we might do. The ball gets rolling, and a couple weeks later they register the domain name. Then a few weeks after that, they get their first interview with IGN, and then they start going panic mode, set up all their social network and everything because they forgot to do this, right? By the way, let's not forget to trademark this too, because that's important, and let's knock on another interview with this one with PC Gamer. And I'd like to remind you, this is where Sergey says that this is something they've been working on for the past couple years. And I think it's pretty safe to say that that is absolutely not true. Now that we're moving forward in time, let's take a look at the next week, August 1st. Here is where we have the first official press release from Arctos Entertainment. Like every press release that comes out, it says nice things about the game, got a couple good quotes in there, right? At the very bottom though, there's something very interesting. It says Arctos Entertainment will publish the War Z through OP Productions LLC, a newly created subsidiary. And for those of you guys who don't know, an LLC is a limited liability corporation. What that means is that if you decide to sue them, you can only sue them for the amount of capital they put into it plus any profits. Which means you're gonna have a really hard time trying to sue the people behind it, which would be, you know, Arctos and maybe Hammerpoint and I guess even online warmongers. Which, by the way, is an LLC and Hammerpoint Interactive pretty much came out of nowhere, so I guess the term pop-up companies applies here. Now over the next several weeks, players go through and they find all these similarities between War Inc. and War Z. Obviously, they took the game and they just reskinned it, similar to how DayZ is functioning right now. Then on October 4th, I get an email from them with the packages to pre-order and get early access to the alpha and then the beta, which starts on the 31st. Now I find this very interesting because the beta is also the launch date, which means that we have pretty good reason to believe that they only worked on this game for about six months. Hmm, well, let's go ahead and keep moving here. Not a whole lot happened. Okay, sure, they got caught for using League of Legends Terms of Service right here, and we know that, so, you know, Stardegate used to be uh, an employee of theirs, so maybe he just felt that he was entitled to using that. He also, I guess, felt entitled enough to call his own paying customers faggots for playing the game in a manner that was technically by design. Now, besides some grumblings here and there, it was pretty quiet up until mid-December. We're gonna go and call this the Day of Reckoning. Actually, if you guys don't mind, there's, actually, there's multiple days that this occurred over, so we're gonna call it the Days of Reckoning. How's that? Okay, fine. December 17th, the game launches on Steam. This is a massive deal because when you put it on this platform, you're basically telling the world, hey, I have this finished game, it's called War Z, and since we already know that Arma 2 has sold exceptionally well over the past several months because of DayZ, it wouldn't be such a stretch to say that some players probably thought that they were buying into the DayZ standalone. But let's take a look at the page they put out that details everything that's in the game. Notice how there's a lot of stuff here, highlighted in red. Thank you very much, Proto Man Eats Babies, the user on Reddit, for doing this for us. But as you can see, there are features that are not in the game itself, and it doesn't say anywhere that these are coming soon. And since all of this was on the page to sell a product, it pretty much qualifies it for false advertisement. And then to make things even more public, popular gaming personality Total Biscuit puts out a lengthy video featuring Warzy gameplay. And with a title like The Boar Z, you could probably estimate roughly where he stands with the game. 
And at the same time, players are just rampaging all over this game, tearing it apart bit by bit. And the thing is, a lot of these arguments are pretty valid. For example, we have somebody who put out a pretty good argument as to how big the map is, and he came out to about 10 square kilometers instead of the advertised 100. Then there was this promotional image that was torn apart because it contained very obvious copies from the extremely popular show The Walking Dead. And then these guys had the nerd to put out a patch that changed a couple of things, a couple of very important things. You see, when you die in the Warriors, you have a bit of a cooldown before you can go and res. And the time to wait used to be one hour, but on this day, for some reason, this patch, they decided to increase it to four hours, but they gave you the feature, the option to pay to res early. On the same day, GameSpy gets an interview with Sergey to talk about all the stuff that's been happening over the past 24 hours, and what he delivers is quite possibly the most smug and or oblivious interview you've ever seen a developer give. This thing is loaded with so much, you can make an entire higher video off of just this one article but I'll go ahead I'll just read a couple for you just so you kind of get the gist of it so he says uh let's be frank when you read up to 100 players what does this mean to you personally I mean for me it doesn't mean that I'll be playing with 99 other players really smiley face and yes the game supports 100 players heck it supports over 400 players as of today but do we want servers launch this number of slots no we don't because it's not what the players want then when he was confronted with the question about the size of the maps, which they mentioned there are not multiple worlds, he did say that 100 square kilometers falls into 100 to 400, right? The whole thing was an absolute mess, and there's a lot of things that I'm leaving out because so much happened just in this few days period. I mean, the game was so poorly represented that it was actually removed from the Steam store. That's pretty bad. Everything beyond this was pretty much refunds. Over the next couple days, people were basically trying to get a refund from this company, come up with their own technique and strategies and guides on how to get refunds because Hammerpoint was trying on every front to prevent people from doing so. Sergei then posted an apology on the official War Z forums, and it reads roughly that they got carried away, they took their success for granted, and that the War Z will be one of the biggest online PC titles released this year. I'd love to show you the actual post, but uh, it was deleted too. But that's okay because it was later replaced by another one that was a little less damning after the holidays. And remember, everybody's digging something up on the War Z lately, right? Everybody's looking for dirt, and some more dirt was found. The US Patent and Trademark Office had noted that they have suspended the trademark for the War Z, which essentially means that they will more than likely have to change their name. But that's not all. Turns out they don't even have the trademark for War Inc. or the name of the company itself, Arctos Entertainment Group. So great, the game, the franchise, and the company names need to be changed? And some of these are old. They're never gonna do this. Look, if you spent money on the War Z, that money's gone. The only thing those poor bastards did was purchase a reminder to never buy into what should have been recognized by them as a poorly executed cash grab scheme supported by shifty personnel in pop-up companies. All right, so that's it. Yes, uh, it's been a very long and very, very traumatic and dramatic year, depending on who you are. Uh, there's some honorable mentions, of course, that I'd like to go and throw out there that didn't quite didn't quite have the meatiness to go ahead and throw into it, in my opinion. Uh, some of you guys might, uh, you guys might not agree, but of course there's a Bohemia Interactive, uh, which is a massive thing that's going on right now, but uh, it's something worth noting. Lots of stuff surrounding it. Did they do something illegal? Uh, should they be being, should they be held for such, such long, uh, whatever? It is just all this other like controversy around it. So people are just like, oh, it's Greece, who cares? Well, they have laws too. But at the same time, what they're doing is dumb. You see, it gets the whole political thing, so. Definitely worth noting. So go check that out at least. Those guys are still in jail, and uh, I hope I hope for their family's sake that these guys get out sometime soon. Uh, you know what? Nothing else. I mean, especially after Bohemia. Like I'm not Mass Effect Three ending. Like that's phew, nothing. That, that holds nothing compared to the things that have occurred this year. Uh, especially when you talk about C38 Studios uh, with them, you know, them laying off 400 people, and then of course the downsizing and layoffs that are going on with Sotor. You see, there's so much stuff happening this year. That it's just, it's just insane. So I hope to God that 2013 is not as controversial as 2012 because this damn video took forever to put together. But feel free to leave comments below. And of course, I'll be checking on my new subreddit, r slash aka Mike B, reddit.com slash r slash aka Mike B. You can check it out there. There'll be a pretty, there more than likely will be a pretty good sized conversation going on there. We'll be more than happy to read your comments on YouTube, Facebook, zam.com. Wowhead, tank spots, wherever you guys leave them, I'll be reading them. That's it. 2013's here, guys. Let's go ahead and I guess we'll keep playing video games or something. I'm trying really hard not to lay people off. <laughs>